another historical fiction author chat today with my special guest, Mandy Robotham, and her new book, The Girl Behind the Wall. I'm very excited. I've been a big fan of Mandy's ever since this one, which I know you all saw I was raving about. Hello, Mandy. Thank you for being here. Hello. Um, Canada. I'm so happy that you're here. I've been reaching out to you thinking, oh, I wonder if she's too busy. She's always writing. So let's see. Um, so I will read you Mandy's bio and the synopsis for The Girl Behind the Wall, and then we will listen to it. So I hope you have your tea and crumpets or biscuits ready so you can sit back and listen and relax as she reads to us. Um, my cup of tea. He's ready. I got my coffee somewhere. I don't even, I've uh, got my, my Tim Hortons cup here. So um, I'm ready to go. So here is the bio, this short and sweet. Mandy Robotham is a Globe and Mail, USA Today, and UK, Canadian, US, and Australian Kindle top 100 bestseller. She has been an aspiring author from the age of nine, but was waylaid by journalism and later enticed by birth. She's now a former midwife who writes about birth, death, love, and everything else in between. She graduated with an MA in creative writing from Oxford Brookes University. And now, the girl behind the wall. From the internationally best-selling World War II novelist comes a story set at the dawn of the Cold War in Berlin. A city divided. When the Berlin Wall goes up, Karen is on the wrong side of the city. Overnight, she's trapped under Soviet rule in unforgiving East Berlin and separated from her twin sister, Jutta. Jutta, not sure. Two sisters torn apart. Karen and Jetta lead parallel lives for years, cut off by the wall, but Karen finds one reason to keep going. Otto, the man who gives her hope, even amidst the brutal East German regime, one impossible choice. When Jetta finds a hidden way through the wall, the twins are reunited, but the Stasi have eyes everywhere, and soon Karen is faced with a terrible decision to flee to the West and be with her sister, or sacrifice it all to follow her heart. Oh, I'm excited. That sounds beautiful. All right. Oh, good. Now I'm going to turn the screen over to you, Manny. I'm going to disappear. And, uh, and here you go. It's, it's up to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to read just the first or, or part of the first chapter um, of the book. And it will, I think, try to give you a bit of a flavor of where whereabouts we are. So um, I'll skip the prologue, but this goes into the first chapter, uh, chapter one, separation. 13th of August, 1961, West Berlin. The pushing and pulling invades Jutta's dream like a poker into hot fire as she stirs from under a cloak of sleep. Jutta, Jutta, a hushed urgency from Hugo as her eyes adjust to the velvet black of her bedroom. His hands nudge at her, but her cousin remains a ghostly outline in the dark. What's wrong? Is it Karen? Is she worse? Yutta's first thoughts go to disaster and possibly death, such as the anxiety that has been a constant in her shifting nightmare. Thoughts of Karen swimming in dreams. Nothing but her. No, it's not Karen. At least there's no word. Hugo's whispers weave through the air, his desperation rousing her. What's wrong then? She sits up, rubbing irritant sleep from her lids. There's something happening in the streets. I'm going to investigate. Come with me. It's barely a question or a choice. For whatever reason, Hugo hopes she will come. On one or two occasions previously, Yutta has accompanied him on a story for the Berlin radio station where he's a junior reporter, one up from a trainee and tea boy. The last was a skirmish six months before near the border on Invaladastrasse, where kids on the west side were lobbing missiles at the East German guards and scurrying for shelter as if racing back to retire to their mother ap apron strings. The brief episode was shut down swiftly by police on east and west sides, neither enjoying a full-scale conflict over pieces of rubble, and Jutta hadn't particularly relished the experience. Do I have to, she says lazily. I think you'll want to. The station says this is big. They think there's a wall going up. Despite the heat of past weeks, West Berlin at 3 a.m. is chilly, Yotta sh shivers under a light jacket, her arms clinging to Hugo's waist as his, two, his small two-stroke motorcycle drones through the darkened streets, east towards the tenuous borderline that divides their city, her hastily tied hair flying like a black pennant behind them. The closer Hugo weaves towards the main thoroughfares, the more people they see. 
not hordes, but more than would normally be returning from the club land of Kerfurstendam on a Saturday night in August, especially as the city has been partially emptied by Berliners headed for their rural summer houses for the weekend. Still, the pair can see no discord, not yet, nor hear any protest. So far, only bodies trickling towards their own destination of the Brandenburg Gate. When they arrive, there are people collected at the monument, the vast stone symbol of Berlin's hard fought freedom. Around a hundred or so, Yatta guesses, though it's eerily quiet. All, without exception, are looking into one direction towards the gate. Except it is no longer a gate because gates generally open and shut. This one is now firmly closed, barricaded by a lengthy coil of barbed wire on the western side and by the close knit line of East German People's Police, VOPOs, on the east. In the eerie blue glare of portable searchlights, Jutta squints at the string of military men mixed with oddly clad factory fighter soldiers in their peaked caps whose shambolic dress makes it seem as if they've been plucked from their beds at only a minute's notice, though she notes they've had time enough to supply each with a short, stubby machine gun. Hugo parks the bike and leaves Jutta's side. He's on, he's on a serious mission now for the radio station, pulling out his recording equipment and hoisting it, uh, sorry, and hoisting it over his shoulders. My Kindle is playing up, apologies. Um, and hoisting it over his shoulder, Jutta moves as if in a dream towards the gate, eyeing the West German police who are shuffling in their own makeshift line in front of the ugly wire, unsure whether they are meant to prevent people from crossing or simply keeping the police that might the peace that might be broken, because they've had no warning. No one has. Some sense of division is no stranger to Jutta and her fellow Berliners. Since 1945, Germany's capital has been split by a border junction between the Eastern Soviet side and the Western Allies, except it's been drawn in chalk almost, moving on occasion as the four powers busy themselves fighting over control of this service or that, transport, water, electricity. Meantime, Berlin has simply step over the divide, albeit through the 80 or so checkpoints dotted across the city, and get on with their lives some living in the West and working in the East and vice versa. Berlin as a city floats in the sea that is now the new East German Republic or GDR, but everyone mingles. They are Berliners first and foremost. But this, Jutta has never seen such a tangible barrier through her city. One not designed to move out of the way, one that's metallic and sharp and would surely pluck and score at her skin if she dare breach it a physical restraint that means she cannot cross or else. As Jutta gapes, it scares her to the core. The idea that this obstacle will stretch the length and breadth of her home city is petrifying because of what's on the other side. Not the Soviet troops and tanks that hover in the hinterland of East Germany, ready to help out the newest of their communist allied states, nor even the universally feared East German secret police, the Stasi, who pervade every inch of Berlin east and west, with eyes and ears everywhere. Not them. Karen, her sister, is on the other side, in East Germany, by pure misfortune. Not just a sister, her only sister, her only sibling, her twin, her entire other half. Panic surges through her. How long will this last? What if they won't let Yutta in or Karen out? What then? Yutta peers past the gate and through the bodies, past the guards that are rolling out yet more spirals of wire and the armoured troop carriers flooding the area. Beyond them are people hovering, fellow Berliners now trapped on the other side. Jutta wonders if they look and feel equally bewildered. On her side, people side part, sidle past as she stares, muttering to themselves and anyone with an earshot. What's happening? They said there would be no wall. He said it plainly, didn't he? No plans for a wall. People in the crowd nod that yes, They'd heard and read it too. Walter Ulbricht, East Germany's communist leader, on a lectern in front of press and witnesses just a few months prior, announcing that there would be no wall to divide the city. The two countries, well, that's been another matter. The Iron Curtain has existed between the two countries of East and West Germany since soon after World War II, leaving Berlin as the only permeable membrane between the two. It's hard to picture an entire metropolis as floating in the land sea of East Germany, 
160 kilometers adrift from the remainder of West Germany, but that's how it is in the, the post-war world. For the Allies, West Berlin is an expensive but symbolic presence behind the Iron Curtain that they strive to keep buoyant with funds and troops. For East Germans, however, the city border acts as a portal to the West, a porous escape route for those desperate to flee communism, with hundreds of thousands using the gateway in recent years, draining the GDR of its most valuable workers. But not now, it seems. Not here and not today. Not anymore. Jutta's reverie is broken by Hugo, who appears at her side, tugging her sleeve. Come on, we should go, he says. His long, lean face is flushed with excitement in chasing this, the biggest of stories, but also fear at what might lie ahead for him and every other Berliner. His wiry body runs towards his bike, clearly impatient for Jutta to clamber on. Where, she says. It's virtually her first word since glimpsing, glimpsing the barbed wire and it feels odd rolling off her tongue. Need to check if it reaches all the way down, circling. Hugo is talking in excited shorthand, but Yutta catches his meaning and it chills her even more. Will there be more wire at every checkpoint? If it engulfs the entire western side, as she fears, reaching Karen will be near impossible. She pictures herself fighting her way across the sharp metal spikes, clawing at her clothes, catching on her skin until the pain forces her to stop and wrench the barbs from her torn flesh. And then what? Arriving bloodied and injured at the hospital where Karen already lies, incapable of engineering an escape for either of them. I need to find a way across to Karen, she shouts at Hugo as they speed along north, along West Berlin streets, filling up now as the word spreads even among the sleeping. Bewildered, some are still in their night clothes, pyjamas poking above hastily donned trousers and shirts. Quiet confusion reigns. We'll have to find an open checkpoint first, Hugo calls behind them. It's less calm, though equally disordered, when they stop briefly at the interchange on Bonholmerstrasse, one of only eight crossings now open, where crowds are beginning to find their voice. This isn't right, one man cries weakly. This isn't democracy. He's right, because beyond the thin wire is communism, but perhaps he feels better for saying it. Another voice. They've stopped the S-Bahn at Friedrichstrasse station, sending the trains back to the east. Someone else shouts that the underground U-Bahn is also blocked, signaling that the link, the rail tree, the rail loop circling the city is broken, breaking one chain, erecting another. Hugo disappears into the crowd again, his microphone pitched awkwardly in front of him, like some medieval jouster. Jutta looks hard beyond the lines of protesters and pinpoints a young East German border guard standing alongside the guard post. With one eye on the machine gun they all seem to be sporting, she weaves her way up to the wire and his face shows surprise. No one else has dared to venture so close, protesting instead from a distance and inching backwards as angry words are tossed and left to float in the air. Despite the wild look in his eye, he has the decency to dip his weapon as Jutta approaches. Can I... Can I get through, she asks. His look of alarm intensifies. Why on earth would she want to cross? She's on the free side, the enclave of Western symbolism. Why would she want to go into the East? No, he says through his incredulity. No one gets through, not today, not without a permit. Then seeing her despair multiply adds, I'm sorry, Fraulein. But my sister, she's in the hospital on your side, Yutta pleads. She's a West Berliner and for the first time she feels the full force of the distinction. She'll be allowed to come back, surely. I don't know, Fraulein, he says. He resumes a detached air, eyes focused on the distance. Jutta thinks he looks fearful of any potential emotion. Perhaps as long as the old women or children don't crumble or weep on him, or weep on him he can keep it together. Maybe he has a mother who is intensely proud of his place in the East German military, boasts to the women in their apartment block of his prowess as a guard. All the same, he looks to be praying. Please don't cry, Fraulein. You can shout at me, berate me, and I will show you the butt of my gun. But just please don't cry. But if she lingers, Jutta feels she might. She peels away, her face beginning to crack with distress as she turns. Hugo is nowhere to be found, though she needs him now. A tall slip of a cousin to bury her head in his bony chest on his clean white T-shirt and share her despair. 
Karen. Oh, Karen, why on earth did you go there? Wow, that's so neat. I, you know, there's so many things, so many stories that are set around World War II, which I love that there's so many. But this part of it, the afterwards, is very, it's not spoken about very often. And I know nothing about the wall and the Cold War. And I'm excited. I'm looking yeah, and I didn't. I didn't know very much either. Um, despite the fact that I were, I was born in 1965, and so I, and it didn't disappear until 1989. So it was part of my life wallpaper, and of all the people I was growing up with. So on the news, of course, we would see, you know, the Soviets against the Americans against the British, and you know all the argy bargy that went on then. Um, and I remember distinctly the. Day day that it came down I was in a service station on a motorway somewhere and we stopped and I remember being in the service station and the television was up on the wall and everybody was just standing there in silence watching these scenes of the wall coming down and people clambering up and and it was just we were all standing there open mouthed and pleased desperately pleased but realizing that history was there in front of us yeah. and yeah. and then so in all the World War II research I've done, I just kept reading about Berlin and reading and then discovered that incredibly it went up in one night. I mean, you could have imagined it. I didn't, Im I didn't, I was so stunned by that. I thought I have to write about this, this thing going up in one night. Yeah, it's, it's, that's an amazing, just the physicality is, is fantastic. Um, again, with all the World War stories that we write, we're used to physicality of a different kind, you know, of, of all the fighting and everything like that. But this is something that was such a division, not just physically, but emotionally. And, and yet it was, like you say, there for so long that most of us really didn't pay attention. At least I didn't. Not no. only this, I was like, oh, well, that's just a thing. That's how it is. So when it came down, that really... You're right. What a thing to come across and then to decide to write about it. It just, it just grabbed you. Is that why you, you needed to? Yes, it did. It really grabbed me. And uh, possibly, I mean, the idea came before the pandemic. So the idea was there. And then I was talking to my agent and she said, oh, well, of course, 2021 is the 60th anniversary. And I went, well, I mean, I've just got to get on with it really then, haven't I? And my yeah. publishers agreed, you know, it's, it seems so poignant to, to bring it out on the 60th um, anniversary, which is August the 13th. And I, I just got more and more engrossed in this story and the human stories surrounding it. And there are pictures, um, I probably have one somewhere about here. There are pictures of babies being, you know, sort of held up over the wall and over the wire and um, a very poignant story about a woman who'd left a cat behind to visit somebody in the east side I think or vice versa and um, you know desperately had to leave her cat behind because and that's not the same as a human but oh it just shows God. you you know the, the hurt that was caused by it yes um, and just by these old fuddy-duddy idealist men who really just wanted to get one over on the west as far as I can tell anyway you know the politics are probably a lot deeper than that but you know it just goes to show you you cannot you cannot corral people and you can't build walls that people can't get over you know it came down because it had to yes exactly they just the people just had to get strong enough to do it um yeah wow what an awakening so what was the research like for all of this like um I I don't know was it hard to find all these all the back the backstory to it and or was it because for me the the research would be about what happened coming down so all the all the research you must have done as it went up would be interesting yeah there's a lot of really good um there's some really good core textbooks history textbooks um that are just focused on the wall and so you know they give a, a really good um a timeline of the wall going up i watched a lot of youtube videos as well there's a lot because people had cine cameras in those days. And so I watched a lot of YouTube, especially about the and the Kennedy speech features in the book as well. Um, what I love to do is be able to get real life scenarios and wrap my characters around them. So my character Yutta, then she she turns up in the, you know, the, the huge packed square when Kennedy makes his very famous Ich bin einer Berliner 
speech. Um, I have to apologise for my pronunciation in that reading. It's just dreadful. It's just dreadful. So I apologise to any Germans listening or any German speakers. I really apologise. Um, so, yeah, I watched a lot of that, uh, a lot of Netflix. There's some some really and, you know, things like uh, the film The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Um, really good black and white films made in the era of the era. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, really good. Wow. And so how does your process work with writing? Do you start with the research or do you do like me and sort of start with the foundation and then keep researching the whole time that you're writing? Is that? Bit of both, bit of both. I have my vague plot. I'm not a big plotter. Can't do it for some reason. I have a beginning I, and an end. I have, I have a tried? beginning and end. Yeah, <laughs> I can't do it. Um, I tried. <laughs> and then somewhere I sort of meander somewhere, you know, so I have a beginning and end here and then I sort of just somehow get <laughs> to that place and it changes all the time. So I do about one to two. So imagine if I got probably about eight months, then I'll do one to two months research, just pure research, reading, reading, making notes. And then I will start to write, but I'll carry on researching and keep going back over things as well um, as I'm doing it. And then for this one, I it, it was looking like it wasn't going to be possible, but I managed to squeeze in between the two lockdowns that we had. Uh, I managed to squeeze in a trip to Berlin um, on my own. And that was amazing. That really helped. That gave the book an extra layer because that's when I went to the Stasi Museum. Um, I walked all the journeys. So there's sort of lots of journeys there's several cafes as you might imagine from my books there's always a cafe there's always coffee um there were several cafes that I found that were still there and I walked those journeys from one to the other um and sort of timed them as well and you know that's really important and then I went to the the prison as well the Stasi prison which is you know mind-blowing I bet um, that would yeah. be amazing. and so this is still with your writing. I think that I read The German Midwife in 2019. Is that right? Is that when it came out? Yes, it came out here, I think, in 2018. So it must have been 2019. Yeah. So does that mean that this is your fourth book in two years? In three years, probably if you, yeah, fourth book in three years. That's uh, me. Yeah. <laughs> And this one was pushed forward. You know, I had to do this quite quickly and pushed forward because of the anniversary as well. So, you know, they, the publisher said to me, do you think you can do it? And I said, uh, I think I can do it. Uh -oh. <laughs> I think I can do it. That's amazing. So how long, how long on average does it take for you to write a book? And I hate that question because I think every book is different, but sort of on average. I think if I'm on a contract and on a commission and I've got a deadline, probably be about eight months I mean I would like a year but yeah you know to be honest I was working full-time when I wrote the first one and as a midwife and on call and doing all those things and I still wrote and I think it's I think you just make time or space and now I've got more time because I'm not working as a midwife anymore but in actual fact I'd probably push out just as much to just have a bit more fun in between you know I'm I'm enjoying not having to get up for work and because I'm notoriously bad at that, but um, <laughs> I'm enjoying not having to get up in the middle of the night and have babies. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you just work to women work to whatever they've got, don't they? That's yeah. what I think they do. And so when you were you were working full time as a, as a midwife and then you so writing would have been just a hobby. How did you make the jump to to do that full time? I was a journalist many years ago before I was a midwife. I was a journalist, a sort of a very local hack, um, local papers. And then I worked a little bit for the Evening Standard in London. And then I was freelance as a, I did a lot of ma um, women's magazines. And then I had a baby and then my whole world, <laughs> for obvious reasons, when you have a baby. It, but for me, it was a bit of an epiphany. I decided I was going to be a midwife straight away. And so but that was full throttle for the sort of next 20 years. And I always kept saying, I'm going to write a book one day. I want to write a book because I've since a child, I've just been in awe of authors and writing books. I used to sort of hold a book in my hand and think, how does anyone put get that many words out of them? that many how can they be in your head you know 
I was very in awe and I kept saying and then you know children life I've got two children and they're grown up now and then when they grew up I thought I'm never going to do it on my own so I joined a couple of writing groups which I found really helpful and then on the back of that I did a master's um, at Oxford Brooks University in Oxford and I did that while I was working one day a week and it was bliss for one day every week we just went I went to Oxford we sat in this beautiful room and we taught books and we wrote and it pushed us into writing and it was out of that just as I finished the idea for the German midwife popped into my head oh that sounds beautiful yeah and and then it took you know as you know every writer knows it doesn't it's not automatic you know it took me a while to write it to then get you know gather my rejections <laughs> does <laughs> gather my rejections and I was just on the point of giving up because I'd had about I don't know 20 rejections from agents and I and my friend said to me um I think Avon have got some open submissions why don't you just send it to them and I said oh I might, I might just sort of you know stop it for six months or so and I said I'm fed up with the rejections and she said no 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 send it and I so I did and then they took it on straight away and the the rest is so I carried on working part time for about probably maybe a year after it was published. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been given up work a year now. So, uh, well, I'm so glad that that happened because <laughs> yeah. I love reading your books. So, uh, all four of your books are standalone, right? There, there's it's not a series. There's no yes. sequels or anything. So that leaves a lot of. And now that you've gone beyond World War II, it just opens up a lot more ideas. So, what's next? People always ask well, that. Right? Like you put out and then two days later, they're like, okay, I've finished. What's next? (laughs) Well, as you well know, as a writer, you've always got one just coming out, one just finished. And then the next one in production, because, you know, none of us, well, none of people I know are Hilary Mantel's (laughs) of this world that that we can afford to spend years and years and years um, crafting a book. So I've, finished book number five and that goes back into world war ii um and that is i love scandinavia i'm very fascinated by scandinavia and so i'm going back to bergen in norway and it's going to link up with shetland the shetland isles and norway um in that um and it's i think probably i'm leaning a bit more towards spy and espionage um i'm really fascinated by spy books i'm reading everything i can get my hands on at the moment about spies and um britain in the 1960s was very rich with spies we had a lot uh you know there was the burgess the mclean the philbys the and so we've got a very rich history of spies um in in britain and of course in world war ii there was as well so i'm reading lots of spy stuff at the moment oh that's fun because i've thought about doing something similar and i just can't think that way i think you would have to read a lot to get in that mind frame because i i don't know how to be sneaky that way i don't know how to, to, to <laughs> <laughs> the problem is i want all my spies to be nice that's the yes. problem i look all to be nice but they're not really you know that's let's face right. it exactly <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to that one. I'm looking forward to this one when it comes out. Um, I think uh, the uh, the whole idea of the girl behind the wall is so new and so different. And I, and I love your writing anyway. I love you. You write so richly and you're, uh, you go into places that a lot of authors are afraid to go. Like it's very gritty and it's my type of writing. I love it. I love oh, it. Oh, thank you. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming to chat with me today. Um, it's been really great to meet you finally. And, uh, yeah, I- and it's been, I love doing this. I love, you know, talking about books is the best thing in the world for me. Yes, it is. And today, July 6th is your launch day here in Canada. So, yeah. but not everywhere, right? No, you get, you Canadians get it first. You get the paperback <laughs> first, along with New Zealand and Australia. And then we have to wait for the paperback till September. Um, and that's because I've got such a, you know, Canadians are such great book buyers um, and they've been really, really nice to me. So thanks very much. <laughs> well, and we will welcome you whenever you get to cross over, whenever things open up, if you come back to Canada, we'll take you on a little tour around. It will be lovely. It will be lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Mandy. I hope you ha- enjoy the rest of your summer.
Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.